Open up your Bibles, please, to Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9. So we're in discipleship class number 18, I believe. Number 18. So today we'll be talking about production of the Bible. Production of the Bible. Now, in discipleship classes, I've been teaching about hell last week. And I've given you a homework assignment. So... In case people did not know about the homework assignment, the homework was to watch Redactor Criticism of the Bible. For those of you who don't know, then watch our previous discipleship video. And then in the end of that video, it will show you the homework assignment where to find the link. The link should be right below the video. And then you just click on that. So it should be discipleship class number 17, not this video, the previous discipleship video. There's a link underneath that video. You click on it, and when you click on it, then uh, you'll have an audio. All right, what we're going to do is this. So I'm going to do something a little bit different in discipleship. So I know that there's so much classes in basic doctrines. Now, I used to teach five studies per teaching. But that was a little bit too much for all of you. And Robert, I apologize. Can you go inside the room there and then get the papers out of the printer? I forgot to pass it out. It should be in the printer there. Thank you, sir. So in Discipleship Basic Doctrines, I've been going five studies per lesson, which is too much. So I tried one by one. But if we go one by one, we're going to take two years in or three years in Discipleship three years actually in discipleship beginners because when i taught these doctrines when i first started my church it took me two years so what i'm going to do is this i'm gonna so i want everyone online to pay attention and anyone who's partaking in discipleship class to pay attention so i have this sheet here i will upload it for people online too actually so i'll give you a bonus i'm going to post this online for the people this sheet and I'm going to give this sheet to all of uh, the people who attend discipleship classes. In this sheet, we're going through different branches of theology. That's what we're going through. All right, so I'll pass this around, and uh, you can pass around to different people. That way they can get an idea. So front and back, you'll notice that, front and back. We're going to go through different theological studies in discipleship. It's, we're going to be covering bibliology, study of the Bible, theology, study of God. Christology, study of Christ, uh, spirit, uh, pneumatology, study of the Holy Spirit, and uh, Christianology, study of the church. We're going to also cover uh, anthropology, study of man. We're going to cover homartiology, study of sin, eschatology, study of the end times, angelology, the study of angels, demonology, the study of demons, and etc. So all those branches, that's what we've been going through in all of our discipleship classes. You guys just didn't know that. So I'm gonna send you that sheet so you can get a better idea. But what we're gonna do now, so which was the point of this last homework assignment, what we're gonna do is we're gonna go through all the branches one by one. So we're gonna cover bibliology. Bibliology. So we're gonna cover bibliology. So we're gonna finish all those studies and then we're gonna to jump to the next study after that, which is theology and then Christology. In bibliology, I've given you a few teachings. We talked about, I talked about inspiration and preservation. I talked about canon of the Bible. And I've given you a homework assignment, redact or criticism of the Bible. Now what we're going to cover is we're going to be covering production of the Bible. Okay, so that's tonight's lesson, production of the Bible. I've given you all pieces of paper uh, for people online. I'm not going to give you the paper for these lessons, but they will be written out and you got a pause button so you can just uh, write those notes down. You can rewind the video and make sure you write all the notes down. Okay, so those of you who have papers, you got the benefit. You also can write down whatever notes you want. This paper is yours, so you can throw it away, rip it up, or write down notes or even put an X mark. No, he's wrong right here. No, I'm kidding. Don't do that. But anyways, this will be very helpful for you. It's yours to do whatever you guys want to do with it. Okay. All right. Here we go.
We're going to start our production of the Bible. First of all, let's cover the definition of the Bible, shall we? First point, definition of the Bible. What's the definition of the Bible? The definition of Bible, it's from the Greek word biblios. It came from the Greek word biblios, which means the book. I think that's appropriate how God calls our Bible. Amen. It is definitely the book. There is no other book like it. No other book will surpass it. So it is definitely the book. So since this is basic doctrines, it's important for you to know this. If you don't know these doctrines, then you're going to be very shallow in Bible knowledge. That's why this, these discipleship classes are here for you. So you can know the basic doctrines of Christianity and it will be helpful for you in the future. Okay, now we're going to be covering the next section, which is Testaments of the Bible. Testaments of the Bible. Now, obviously, there are two Testaments in your Bible. It composes two sections. One is the Old Testament, and the other is the New Testament. Now, if someone were to ask you how many books are there in the Old Testament, uh, do you know the answer to that question? So, If someone asked you how many books are in the New Testament, do you have the answer to that question? But if you have the answer to knowing verses about blue-blooded aliens or weird stuff and stuff like that, and you don't know how many books there are in your Old and New Testament, that's not good. That's why these basic doctrines, you got to know basic. Otherwise, it'd not, it'd not be a good thing. All right, how many books are there in your Old Testament? There are 39. There are 39 books in your Old Testament. As for the New Testament, there are 27. The total count in your Bible will be 66 books. So remember that. There will be 66 books in your Bible. Now, concerning about testaments, we're going to look at Hebrews 9. Why are there testaments in the Bible? Okay, there are two testaments in the Bible. I get it, Pastor. Ah, but remember, uh, you got to realize this. You can't just say, okay, and then believe it. You got to go like, why? Why would they have it? That's why we got to go to the basics. Sometimes we just believe it just says Bible, so we're going to say Bible. No, why do we say we call it Bible? Because of the definition there. So let's see why we call it Testaments. Look at Hebrews chapter 9, verses 15 through 19. Verses 15 through 19. And for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament. So Jesus is the mediator of the New Testament. Why? That by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first testament. There's your Old Testament. They which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. For a testament is, there must also of necessity be the what? Death of the testator. That's the key. For a testament is a force after men are dead. Otherwise, look at this, it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. So notice that this New Testament cannot even happen until the testator dies. That's why today when there's a testator who dies and we read his will and testament, that can only occur when the testator dies. Who died? The Lord Jesus Christ. Thus, he can start a brand new testament. See that? That's what's very important to understand. But then why can we start the Old Testament? Think about it. Why did we have the Old Testament? When Adam and Eve were in the garden, you got to understand this. There is no Old Testament. If Adam and Eve didn't sin, there's no Old Testament. You might say, then how, why did the Old Testament exist? Because who died for that Old Testament occurred? Look at verse 18. Whereupon neither the first testament was dedicated what? without blood for when moses has spoken every precept to all the people according to the law he took the blood of calves and of goats with water and scarlet wool look at that because of the blood the animals that's why the old testament could occur but that makes sense why moses was the one who cons we put his first five books in the bible it makes a lot of sense now. We would start that off with the Bible. Why? Because it mentioned Moses here with the sacrifice of animals. Now you understand why we got Old Testament and New Testament. Not just because we have it, oh, we call it, oh, it's just religious tradition. No, it's because there were innocent beings that die. Innocent lambs, as well as the Lamb of God. Now let's talk about divisions of the Bible. Now this one is... 
out of a uh, out of most of the teachings that I'm teaching you in discipleship classes on basic doctrines, tonight is extremely important. This is basic of all basics that even Sunday school children who are saved in the Lord will know this stuff. So those of you who are Bible believers and you know deep doctrines, if you don't know this, it's going to be very shameful. So that's why it's going to be important that this class you keep an eye out. Okay, divisions of the Bible. There are 10 divisions in the Bible. There are basically 10 divisions. We're going to cover these 10. The one is law. Law. That would cover from Genesis to Deuteronomy. The books of Genesis to Deuteronomy. That's the first division, law. The second one let's is history. History. If there's something wrong with the camera, please let me know. That way um, uh, we don't just keep going and lose people. No, it's keep going, but uh, it's just saying slow internet warning. So I just I took my, my mm -hmm. thing off of the uh, okay the Wi-Fi. We'll see what will happen from here. Okay, so then Joshua to Esther. Joshua to Esther. If we lose connection, let me know. Okay. All right, so history is Joshua to Esther. That's the second division. All right, the next division, uh, the next division is poetry. Poetry. Poetry would cover from the books of Job all the way to Song of Solomon. The next division, so let's put it all the way here, Job to Song of Solomon. The next division is going to be major prophets, major prophets, put it all the way here. Major prophets would cover from Isaiah to Daniel, Isaiah to Daniel. The next division is what we call minor prophets, minor prophets. Those are those little books that you have the most struggle with during Bible study classes. All right, turn your Bibles to the book of Hosea, and then you'll take like 10 minutes finding that. So minor prophets, those are from the books of Hosea to Malachi, Hosea to Malachi. Then you got the New Testament. We start, it's called the Gospels. Thus, you hear what's called the four Gospels. Where did we get that from? It's from here, this idea. It's going to be covering from Matthew to John. Then you got what's called history. History. And that would be from the book of Acts. Let me know if the words are out of bounds. Okay, then. We're going to, uh, the next section. So we're going to, we're running out of space here. So I will put on top here. The next section is the Pauline epistles. Pauline epistles, that's the next division here. The Pauline epistles is the most important section in your Bible for Christian doctrine. Yeah, so this one, you have to remember what Pauline epistles are. If you hear me teach this quite often, Pauline epistles, Pauline epistles, I don't want you to get lost in that. I don't want you to say, well, what does Pastor Kim mean? No, now you know what he means. It's Romans to Hebrews, Romans to Hebrews. Now, in Hebrews, we put a question mark. Now, why is that? Because Paul is the author of this book, yet this book is containing a different application to a different group of people. It says Hebrews. So this is not to the Christian church. You'll notice in the Bible, it says to the church that be at Rome, the church of Corinth, and etc. But here's the Jewish people. So Hebrews, what we put this in, is in general epistles general epistles. But for this study, I'm going to just put Hebrews with Pauline epistles because Paul's the author. However, whenever we say general epistles, I want you to understand this. It covers the book of James and Jude, general epistles, but it's going to include Hebrews. I want you to remember that. It's going to include Hebrews. Then you got the book on prophecy, and that's Revelation. So those are your 10 divisions, and you should remember that next time. So these are your 10 divisions right here. Now we're going to cover the names of the Bible. Okay, now think about this. you got to have a biblical proof why you call this why you have the Bible. Now think about this. Didn't you know that the word Bible is not in your Bible? How about that? The word Bible is not in your Bible. Well, does that mean then the, that God never mentioned the Bible here as our final authority? No, he did. There are four things he calls it. So whenever you look at your Bible 
and you want evidence that God is quoting from the Bible, you can't just look up the word Bible. It's not going to be in there. You're going to use four things. So these are the important four things. It's going to be called scriptures. Scriptures. That's John 10, 35. John 10. Go to John chapter 10. John chapter 10. And we'll look at verse 35. Verse 35. I'll write these remaining stuff down. It's also called writings. Writings. And then I'll write the passage here. John 5, 47. Try to go to these four passages when you can. The other one is called Word of God. Word of God. That's going to be found at the book of Acts. You can look at the board too in case that you get lost. It'll be Acts chapter 17, verses 11 through 13. Then it's also called the Oracles of God. Oracles of God. So whenever you want proof where the Bible mentions the Word of God or the Bible itself as its final authority, then uh, these are the terms what the Bible will call it. Okay. Now, why would we call it scriptures? Why is scripture accurately referring to the Bible? Because scripture is translated, fr transliterated from the Latin word scriptura, and that means writings. Writings is pretty obvious because it's written on a piece of paper what God said. So writings is not a problem. The word of God, well, obviously the word of God follows the scriptures. That's where God's word is found. Oracles of God, why do we call it that? Because an oracle delivers a word from the divine. That's why it's at, the Bible is accurately called oracles of God. Now you know why these four words are accurately referred to the names of the Bible. We didn't make it up. Look at John chapter 10, and we will read verse 35. Notice what the Word of God says right here. What did the Lord Jesus Christ say concerning the Bible? He said right here concerning the Word of God, if he called them gods unto whom the Word of God came, and the notice Scripture cannot be broken. Notice Word of God is in line with the word Scripture. Thus we know Scripture is an accurate term to refer to the word of God, what God says. Now, John chapter 5, verse 47. Chapter 5, verse 47 says, But if he believe not his writings, how shall he believe my words? Notice that God's words can be found in what the biblical authors wrote in their writings. Now, uh, Acts chapter 17, verse 11. I'm going to be turning to these real quickly, so if you can't make it, don't worry. You can just listen up. Acts chapter 17, verse 11 through 13 says, These were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily. See that? That word scriptures is in there. And then the word of God is in line with scripture. So we know that's accurate. Whether those things were so, the other one is Romans chapter 3, verse 2. Romans chapter 3, verse 2. And that's perhaps the least mentioned. Maybe this is the only verse. Maybe this is the only verse in your whole Bible that refers to the Bible as oracle. Oracle. Romans 3, 2 says, Much every way chiefly, because that unto them were committed, notice, the oracles of God. All right, now let's talk about the position of the Bible. So let me erase the board right here. We're going to talk about the position of the Bible. There are three positions in the Bible, you got to understand. There are mainly three positions in the Bible. Look at Job chapter 23, please. Please turn to Job chapter 23. Job chapter 23. Please turn to Job chapter 23. The position of the Bible. That's the next section. All right. The position of God's word is that it is more important than living by food. Mm, yeah. It is more important than living by food. Yeah, amen. I'm going to be very honest with you. So if you're starving to death, you got to realize this. What's more valuable than your own stomach is actually the word of God. Mm. Now that's pretty extreme, but that's how important your Bible is, you must understand. It's even more important than your own life. Because this one gives you spiritual life right here. So it's more important than food. Now we're going to look at the book of Job, 
chapter 23. See right here, more important than food. Let me draw a half line right here. Look at Job chapter 23, and we'll read verse four, uh, verse 12. I, and then if you have time, jump to Matthew 4 as well. Have your second hand at Matthew 4. So 4, 4. All right, so we're going to look at Matthew chapter 4, verse 4, as well as Job chapter 23, and then we'll look at verse 12. Now notice what Job chapter 23, verse 12 says. It says... Neither have I gone back from the commandment of his lips. I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. Matthew chapter 4 verse 4. Jesus was starving in the wilderness. And yet what did Satan make him do? Jesus said this. But he answered and said it is written man shall not live by bread alone. But by every word that proceeded out of the mouth. Of God. That's how important it is. Wow. Look at John chapter 17. John chapter 17. And we'll look at verse 17. John 17, 17. The second thing you got to understand about the Bible's position. So this is how important your Bible is. It's position. In fact, it's the only visible thing. Now, this is important. It's the only visible thing today that shows what is truth. Amen. That means uh, not, not visions, signs, or wonders, or some kind of miracle in front of your eyes. Yeah, amen. It's only the Word of God. That's how important your Bible is. It's the only visible thing today that shows you what is truth. So we're going to look at John chapter 17, and then we will look at verse 17. Notice it's the only visible thing today that shows you what is truth. Sanctify them through thy tr truth. What is truth? Thy word is truth. Let's also turn to Psalms chapter 138. Psalms chapter 138 and verse 2. It is held in high esteem. Now, get ready for this. It is held higher esteem than the name of God. Did you get that? It is held higher esteem than God's name. You might say, wow. Now, in the Old Testament, if you took God's name in vain, what was the penalty for that? You were stoned to death at the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, if you took God's name in vain, you were stoned to death. So think about this. If God takes it that seriously, that you corrupt his name, that you were stoned to death, how much more when you corrupt God's word? God's word. That's why you got to understand this, friend. What you got to understand is that if you uh, take the word of God lightly, then that's not a good thing because God's word is uh, higher than his own name. That's why we make a big deal about having the right Bible, having the right book. Otherwise, it's, gonna, otherwise it's going to be a problem. What's up, brother? Um, I'm just not thinking. It's fine. Keep okay. Then. All right. It's distracting me. That's why. <laughs> okay. Let's look at uh, let's look at Psalms chapter one hundred thirty-eight, and then uh, we will read verse two. Verse two. I will worship toward thy holy temple, and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth. Look at this. For thou hast magnified thy word above what all thy name. Now, how many names of God? is in the Bible. He has so many names. Now, that word is higher than his own name. That should tell you something. That's why we believe in having the right Bible. It's that important. A lot of people, they accuse us, oh, you're worshiping the Bible. No, we're worshiping God Almighty. But we also realize the, how God himself prioritizes his word above his name. So when you think about that, then do you see why we're serious about God's word? Maybe those people are not serious enough about God's word. Amen. The authorship of the Bible. This is fantastic. This is mind-blowing. It's going to blow your mind, and it's a miracle what God does with this book. Do you know any other book that has 40 different authors? No other book throughout all of history can have such a whopping number. It contains 40 different authors this one book. 
Who are the authors? Okay. This one, you will want to know this one. Who are the 40 different authors? I guarantee you this. Even Bible-believing pastors like me, for example, wouldn't be able to name 40 different authors unless it's all written out. So this is a good thing for you. All right. So let's make sure how many we see all these books, right? All these books. All right. Let's see if we can cover all these books with all these authors. Ready? Here we go. One is going to be Moses. Moses. Moses, he's going to be covering from Genesis through Deuteronomy. Genesis through Deuteronomy. And perhaps, perhaps some of Psalms. Some of it. Second one is Joshua. Joshua. And obviously we know what he wrote, the book of Joshua. Third thing is Ezra. Ezra. Obviously, we know that he wrote the book of Ezra. But here's another thing. You perhaps didn't know that. He probably also wrote First and Second Chronicles. You probably didn't know that. So he probably wrote First and Second Chronicles as well, Ezra. The other one is Nehemiah. Nehemiah. Obviously, we know what Nehemiah wrote. He wrote the book of Nehemiah. The fifth author is now, this one is going to be tricky. It's either going to be Mordecai. Mordecai is either the fifth author, or it's either going to be Ezra, or it's either going to be Nehemiah. These are the authors, perhaps, of the book of Esther. Esther. We don't know really who wrote the book of Esther. But we can guess from these three people that they uh, one of these three people probably wrote the book of Esther. David, who, who, which book did he write? He wrote the book of Psalms. Yep. Now, here's the thing, though. He did not write all of the book of Psalms, you got to understand. Mm -hmm. But he wrote most of it. How many? We do know he at least wrote 73 chapters of Psalms. So at least 73 chapters from Psalms. King David wrote. Now, I bet you a lot of people don't know this. Asaph. What? Wait, wait, who is he, Pastor? That's right. <laughs> who is Asaph? He's the one who wrote a lot of your Psalms too, actually. He probably wrote, actually, no, it's uh, what we believe is that he wrote Psalms chapter 50 and 73 to 83. That's quite a number of chapters. Psalms chapter 50 as well as 73 through 83. All right. You didn't know this one. Descendants of Korah. I guarantee you none. No pastor would probably say that one. <laughs> Descendants of Korah. The Descendants of Korah also wrote some of the passage in the book of Psalms. They wrote Psalms chapter 42, 44 through 49. 84, 87 through 88. This is the book of Psalms written by the descendants of Korah. How many of you guys heard of He-Man? And I hope you're not thinking of your television show. That shows how we're so television minded rather than scripturally minded. <laughs> I'll admit, man, I thought about the TV character first besides the Bible. <laughs> So see, that's why this stuff is important. He-Man, okay, where did he come from? Well, he did not come from TV. He came from the Bible. He-Man, the Ezraite, the Ezraite. So he wrote the book of Psalms as well. And he wrote the book of Psalms, chapter 88. Psalms 88. All right, now we're in author number 10. So this is quite a number of authors here. So what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to write the names here. And then you write the books. Ethan, the Ezraite. So the Ezraites, they wrote several passages of Psalms for you. He wrote Psalms 89. The other one is Solomon. Solomon, he obviously wrote a Song of Solomon. He wrote Proverbs, Ecclesiastes. Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. Psalms chapter 127 and maybe 
So this one's something you probably didn't know. Solomon probably wrote Psalms chapter 72 as well. Psalms chapter 72. The other author is Isaiah. Isaiah. And obviously we know what book he wrote, Isaiah. <laughs> the other one is Jeremiah. Jeremiah. Obviously we know he wrote the book of Jeremiah. But he also wrote Lamentations. Now this one's wild. Maybe he wrote First and Second Kings. That one's pretty wild. Yeah. So we're not really sure if that's the case, but maybe he did write it. The other one is Ezekiel. And what book did he write, Pastor? Ezekiel. Duh. I'm just kidding. <laughs> you were probably thinking, like, is this Psalms chapter 111 or something like that? Something mysterious? <laughs> you never know, right? You never know. All right, Daniel. What book did he wrote? Daniel. Simple. Hosea. What did he wrote? Simple. Hosea. Joel, what did he write? Simple, Joel. Uh, Amos, what book did he write? Simple, Amos. Obadiah, what book did he write? Simple, Obadiah. Jonah, what book did he write? Jonah. <laughs> and you can guess. Micah, what book did he write? Micah. Yeah, Micah. Don't say Psalm 71, all right? <laughs> and then uh, let's see right here. Let's go down this way now. All right, let's make another box right here. All right, Micah. Uh, Nahum, what book did he write? Nahum. Nahum, that's right. He didn't write First and Second Kings. No, not, nothing mysterious like that. All right, Habakkuk, what book did he write? He wrote, obviously, Habakkuk. And uh, uh, you have to look at that name two times so you can spell it right. <laughs> All right, 24, Zephaniah. Man, this is a lot of authors, right? Can you imagine how many authors the Lord had for his one book? It's amazing. Your book is incredible, folks, what the Lord did. All of it. And it doesn't contradict. Isn't that something? Not only that, it's the only book from beginning to end yeah, that carried sure. on. That is something else. All right, so Zephaniah wrote Zephaniah, obviously. Haggai, obviously wrote uh, Haggai. And Zechariah, obviously wrote Zechariah. And Malachi, obviously wrote Malachi. And then Matthew, obviously wrote Matthew. And then uh, Mark, obviously wrote Mark. Luke, obviously wrote Luke. John obviously wrote John and and oh finally so and he also wrote first and second third John well that's a no-brainer but he also wrote the book of Revelation all right those are the books that he wrote 32 this one is the author that you want to know the most he's the one that wrote most of the books in your Bible his name is Paul Paul 13 epistles Number 33 is James, James. All right, so I'm going to be erasing the board here again, and then I will name the remaining authors. Now for Paul, uh, let me go backwards here. So James wrote the book of James, we know that. John, you already know. Paul, the books that he wrote is going to be a lot. He wrote Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians. He also wrote... Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd Timothy, Titus, Philemon, Hebrews. So that's approximately 13. And with Hebrews, we put a question mark. We put a question mark. Now, most Bible believers, they believe Paul wrote the book of Hebrews. So most of them lean toward Paul as the author. I tend to join that boat. I tend to lean toward the fact that Paul wrote the book of Hebrews. So if you watch my videos when I mention Paul, what he wrote at Hebrews, it's because I lean toward that fact that Paul wrote the book of Hebrews. But I could be wrong. That one I admit. I could be, wrong. It could be somebody else. But I lean more toward Paul. All right. And then uh, Peter, he's number 34. He wrote 1st and 2nd Peter. And then number 35 is Jude, and he wrote, obviously, the book of Jude. So Peter, 
And then finally, Jude. Jude wrote the book of Jude. Peter wrote the book of First and Second Peter. Now, with all that named, if you look through all this list here of the divisions, you'll notice it covered every single book in the Bible. But then remember, I also mentioned multiple authors for one book, possibly. You remember that? So because of that, that shows right here that it can be more than 40, uh, approximately 40 authors. But not only that, I mentioned about here descendants of Korah, who wrote several chapters in Psalms. So that's not just one person. So the number is approximately 40. It is accurate to say that. Now I'm going to come to my favorite part here, variety of the Bible. This is amazing right here. We're going to talk about the variety of the Bible. This is fascinating how the Lord used your book, friend. Your Bible is such a diverse book. It is a book full of diversity and richness. Look at all the varieties of the Bible and look how God miraculously put all those things together. You understand, one, it was written by a variety of people. That's the first thing you want to observe. I mean, name me any other book throughout all history that does this. It was written by a variety of people. Think about this. It consisted of an educated student, Moses, because remember, he was learned from all the wisdom of the Egyptians. A king, David, for example. A tax collector, Matthew. A doctor, a physician named Luke. A war general named Joshua, for example. A music artist like Asaph. An extremely wise philosopher, Solomon. A government leader like Daniel, because remember, he was like vice president during the reign. Ignorant fishermen, Peter, James, and John. The Lord put them in as part of the authors. Not only that, ragged prophets. These guys were nobodies. They were like your typical uh, street preachers today, all ragged and alone and just preaching. <laughs> Isaiah, all the way through Malachi. Uh, the books of the Bible from Isaiah to Malachi, they were all ragged prophets, all prophets. Regular Christians also were part of the authors. Mark and Jude, for example, and many more. Now think about it. If you're going to write a textbook, I don't think I'm going to get some kind of contemporary music artist uh, a, an ignorant fisherman, and then uh, a, a professor from a school, and a regular student, and then a bunch of ragged nobodies who are just yelling out on the streets, get them all together and say, hey, let's all write the book with the same belief, same idea, same doctrine. How are you going to do that? Unless there's an author that's above all those people, and he's guiding them. That is something else, your Bible, is a variety of people. Not only that, it's written at a variety of time periods, time periods. That's why you got to understand this. This Bible is above the Quran. It's above the Book of Mormon. It's above any science textbook today because there is no other book that has this variety and it miraculously comes together with over 5,000 manuscripts that supports it as overwhelming evidence. Yep. There's no other book, even up to today. Yep. It was written at a variety of time periods. It covered 16 wow. various centuries. You realize that? To be written. Joseph Smith, he had to write it during his lifetime, probably 10 years. This book, man, took 16 centuries. The Quran, Muhammad had to do it a couple of years. And guess what? He didn't even write it. All he was doing was talking and somebody wrote it for him. Science textbooks, you have to get all a bunch of scientists together and they can't do something that will take 16 various centuries long. It covers 16 various centuries, such as Sumerian era, the Babylonian era, the Egyptian era, the Persian era, and the Roman reigns. The first writer died 1,450 years before the last writer was even born. That is something. Amazing with your Bible. Variety of time periods. And isn't it amazing how it all harmonizes? That there is no contradiction. And it gives you a teaching that is that the goal just matched from beginning of Adam to the end. That is something. The third thing is that it was written in a variety of languages. Languages. 
No other book was translated into as many languages as the Bible. It has been translated in more than 1,000 languages and dialects. Do you realize that? Do you realize that? Did the Quran translate that much? Did uh, the Book of Mormon translate that much? How about science textbooks? Man, you'd be the richest author in the world if you had that much translated. I mean, uh, even, oh, what's her name? Uh, I, uh, Dowling, yeah, I think, uh, Dowling? Uh, uh, J.K. Dowling, oh, Rowling. Rowling, Rowling. Rowling. thank you. Rowling. Rowling, okay. J Obviously, I can't believe I don't know her name. At least I know the name of Jesus more than her name, right? <laughs> Her, she was like rich with her Harry Potter books yeah. and Harry Potter books is filled with occultic uh, indications right there and witchcraft. But isn't it amazing that even though she made millions of dollars from that, I mean, she didn't have that many languages translated, yeah, but our God did yeah, with did. one book that you can buy $1 Amen. at a Dollar Tree store. Amen. Didn't you know that? That's something. Some languages include the Masoretic Hebrew, the Greek Receptus, the Old Latin Vulgate, the Syriac Peshitta, the Luther German, the Italian Diodati, French Oliviton, Spanish Valera, and we also have the Korean King James, and etc. What other book? What other book can top this book? There is no other book in all of history that can ever top this book. That's why it's so important to understand that your Bible, is, the production of it, is very unparalleled. I hope that uh, this teaching has been a blessing to you and made you a, a, give you a greater appreciation of what you're holding in your hand. It's not a cheap book. If, if any other book that's sold in bookstores, you understand, had this much of a production process, do you know how much thousands, mm -hmm. probably millions of dollars it would cost? Yeah. Especially if it's a book that has unchanging words ever since the beginning of the BCs. Yeah. You wouldn't even be able to buy it. Yeah. Amen. But you know what God did? God was not selfish to hog the money. What he did was is that he made it cheap. He made people pass it out for free, pass it out for a dollar, pass it out for real at a very good price. And he gave it out to literally many people, many people. Do you know how many copies of the King James Bible they were produced? Billions, billions. I'm not lying. Billions were produced. Secular colleges even teach that. I sat under a class where they, the professor said, yeah, the King James Bible, shoo, billions of copies. I mean, that's something else. They were just spreading them out. And he's a lost professor. See, there. don't think that your book is cheap. This is an expensive book. It's a book that's worth every dime that you pay. Amen. What kind of books, if you had, there was one thing that my dad got saved and got under conviction because there was one thing that bothered in his mind. It's this teaching, production of the Bible. He was thinking, he was, uh, he was ignorant of Christianity. He did not like churches. Christianity was, you know, I don't know of any other book that had such diversity, variety, and sense, and this kind of miracle. Yeah. There's something, there must be something to this book. It's not just an ordinary belief or some fairy tale religion. There must be something. That's when he start to be open hearted. And you know what happens when you're open hearted to the truth? Then you'll get saved and even become a Bible believer. Because of that, that's why I'm here tonight to teach to you, because I have a saved father. Because of what? Because of the amazing production of your book. Never take that for granted. All right. Now, for your homework assignment, so let's see right here. Um, uh, is that chart? Has that been passed around? Can I have that back? Thank you so much, sir. So, we, uh, the great news is, is that we covered every teaching in bibliology. Uh, your homework assignment is going to be uh, in Albin Douglas's book and Dr. Upman's Theological Studies. So some of you might not know that if you're new in this class. But if you started at discipleship number one, you know what I'm talking about. There are two textbooks I had you buy. is Ruckman's Theological Studies and Albin Douglas's book, God's Answers to Man's Question. If you have those two books, your homework assignment is to read the Bible. 
Uh, I don't mean taking your Bible and reading it, okay? As much as I would like for you to do that, that's not going to count as homework. Oh, pastor, I read 20 chapters of the Bible like you told me. Well, that's good, but that's not your homework assignment, okay? What I mean is uh, the lesson called the Bible in Ruckman's Theological Studies and Alvin Douglas's book, all right? Read that one. That will be your homework assignment. Out of all the wrong doctrines that's happening in our day and age at the last days of the church as the apocalypse is coming even closer, the point of all this, friend, is that you won't be even able to grow in knowledge of the truth, in Bible-believing truth, until you get saved first. The most important question you have to ask yourself after watching all this is if you were to die today, are you 100% sure that you're going to go to heaven? Perhaps one of these wrong doctrines have affected you and you had the improper way of salvation. As you have seen before, the way to get saved is very simple. It's only simply salvation by grace alone without works through the Lord Jesus Christ in this Christian day and age. If you're not sure that you can go to heaven after you die, it's very simple to get saved. First of all, you have to understand that because of sin, God is a holy God, and He cannot even allow 1% of sin into heaven. So He has to judge sin with a burning hell. So it is very important that you got to realize how serious sin is, and you must repent. You might say, well then, I guess I have to clean up all my sins. I guess I have to go to church. I guess I have to get baptized. I have to, I have to be a good person. No, my friend, good works can never save you. Jesus is God who died, buried, and resurrected so that he can pay all the sins for you. You don't have to pay a single sin for yourself. So all you have to do as a repentant sinner is turn to what he did on the cross alone for your salvation. You might say, well, pastor, I do believe only on what Jesus did on the cross to save me. That's great, then all you have to do is just say that to the Lord. You might say, well, preacher, I haven't prayed much before in my life. I don't know really how to say it to God. Can you help me out? Sure, you could say it this way. Dear God, I know I'm a sinner. As I repent, I put my faith that Jesus is God and that he died, buried and resurrected so that his blood can wash away my sins. I put my faith in that alone to save me, not my good works. In Jesus' name, I pray, amen. Congratulations, my friend, if you meant it with all your heart that you put your faith only on what Jesus did on the cross through his blood to save you, then you are saved. It's that simple, my friend. Now, my friend, it is important to grow in Bible-believing truth. You now know the truth. What are you going to do about it? As the apocalypse comes even more closer and Satan's about his, to set up his kingdom even more, there are many souls dying and going to hell, and even many more churches out there who don't know right and wrong doctrine. It is up to you now on what to do. And go to our resources site, www.bbcenglish.org, and click on the resources link over there, and it'll give you everything that you need to grow in grace. The next step of your journey now is up to you. We've done our part giving you this movie. All of it was done for free by the love of the people. God bless you.